Bonjour à tous. Good afternoon. Um, we have the pleasure to welcome uh, Professor uh, Olaf Sleipen uh, today with an impressive resume, uh, which I won't describe in detail, but he is an executive director of the Netherlands uh, Bank, the Dutch National Bank, uh, currently a director of monetary affairs, and formerly the, of the supervision of policy uh, division. Uh, is also it's important for uh, for us uh, a crew member of the Social Economist Rat, uh, with, which is the Dutch homologue of the Central Economic Council, and it is an al uh, alternate member of the Governing Council of the ECB. Um, this is a very good uh, pleasure to to welcome uh, Professor Olaf. And we are grateful that he could spare one hour uh, for us, and we look forward to hearing uh, his view on public finance and uh, European uh, fiscal rules uh, in the debate with the Commission and uh, uh, the different state of the uh, European uh, Union. Um, Professor Olaf, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman, for your uh, very kind introductory words. And uh, it's really a pleasure for me to uh, to be here um, uh, with you this uh, this afternoon. Um, unfortunately, still virtually, but uh, yeah, let's hope uh, let's hope that that will uh, at least change uh, in the course of this uh, of this uh, of this year. Um, Indeed, I was asked to uh, share my views about the, uh, and that's also the title of my my talk today, my presentation. You see the 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 the, the slide here in front of you, at uh, the future of the European fiscal rules. Um, and that's what I would like to talk about. So I will I will uh, give uh, give a uh, 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 give a um, uh, indeed short presentation. I'll try to, to give relatively short presentations, but also plenty of room for questions and uh, discussions from your side. Um, first, I would like to go back a little bit in history uh, and uh, why why do we have these uh, budgetary rules, fiscal rules in an economic and monetary union? Um, then uh, I would like to discuss the reasons why uh, we think, or at least this is also the general view, I would say at this point in time, it is good to review those rules. Then I will discuss potential reforms. How could these rules be changed? And then, of course, I will come up with a couple of conclusions. And the views that are presented here today uh, to you by me are the views of the Dutch Central Bank. So these are also... And what I will tell you is basically also it's not like uh, secret information or whatever. It's um, uh, something that you can also find find uh, on our website. Actually, we have published a position paper a couple of weeks ago on um, uh, uh, for for a hearing in the Dutch Parliament on on exactly this topic as well. And my presentation will follow, let's say, that line of reasoning. Uh, let's say very well. Um, so indeed, um, let's start with the first question. Uh, why did we need or do we need fiscal rules in economic and monetary union? Uh, as you uh, all know, economic and monetary union uh, officially started um, <coughs> the, uh, uh, with the fixing of exchange rate of the countries that at that point in time were the, the, the ones to join economic and monetary union. That was on the 1st of January 1998. But indeed, there's a process actually that even precedes this starting point. It was the drafting of uh, what 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 we still refer to, although the treaty has been changed several times uh, ever since. But uh, what we still refer to as the Treaty of Maastricht, which was the the treaty basically um, stipulating the rules of the Economic and Monetary Union. And there, uh, you see that those. Fiscal rules, those budgetary rules imposed upon the member states of uh, the euro area play a very important role. And also in the discussions um, uh, in, 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 in the run up. And the idea was that if you have a monetary union with one monetary policy, but at the same time 
um, independent or let's say uh, national uh, fiscal policies. Um, yeah, if you don't kind of constrain or, or, or create a context for those fiscal policies, you will run into difficulties. First of all, uh, um, the, the, the fiscal policy in one country can have spillover to another country. Uh, uh, it can have uh, an impact on the economy that spills over to the other. And you want to, let's say, I wouldn't say avoid it, but at least uh, constrain it to some extent. And secondly, uh, uh, you don't want to come into a position where uh, monetary policy is complicated because of national uh, fiscal policy, or even worse, that something um, arises that we would now call fiscal dominance, so that the budgetary position or public debt in a specific country or in a group of countries is so high that uh, actually this, the, the, the monetary policymakers, the European Central Bank, would be kind of it, uh, forced to take that into account when making monetary policy. So that's, I think, the other uh, important uh, consideration that played, uh, that played a role. Now, uh, if one goes back to the Maastricht Treaty um, that was negotiated uh, uh, in December 1992, um, there you have something called the excessive deficit procedure and a very pivotal part of that excessive, excessive deficit procedure is um, that the uh, public debt in a member state is should not be higher than 60% of GDP. And if it is higher, uh, there should be, a, let's say, a sustainable decline in the uh, debt ratio. And also the introduction of a rule for the budget deficit, and that's the famous uh, 3%. Now, I already mentioned that that um, this, this excessive deficit procedure was um, changed or, or has been changed quite a lot and the treaty has changed quite a lot as well um, and it already started actually before the start of economic and monetary union that was in 1997 uh, when um, the so-called stability and growth pact was established which we still have and um, uh, it was changed several times uh, thereafter and there were major changes in 2005 2011 and then 2013 and the last two they actually of course were very much influenced by the great financial uh, crisis and the euro sovereign debt crisis so um the current rules and i will go go into the details a little bit more uh, in a second uh, what is the criticism on the current rules and that also explains why there is actually a need to review them is that uh, debt levels um, uh, in the member states are not converging and are actually also increasing. That the deficit rule, but also the debt rule in a way, is working out pro-cyclical. Uh, the whole idea about the Stability and Growth Pact is that um, member states um, create buffers in their public finances in good times when the economy is flourishing which they can use to stabilize the economy in bad times. And actually that's something that we haven't really seen. It's, it's, it appeared to be very politically very difficult to, especially in the good times, to build up the, uh, the buffers. Uh, so um, uh, so the, the framework has turned out to work basically uh, what we call pro-cyclical, so actually enforcing uh, the economic dynamics instead of stabilizing it. And then finally, as you can imagine, due to all those revisions um, throughout the years, um, the rules have become too complex and sometimes even contradictory, uh, too many exceptions, et cetera, et cetera. And it's almost impossible nowadays for anybody to understand, maybe a handful of people really does, uh, how they really interact with each other. Now let's go to the next uh, slide and I will go a little bit more into the details and why we have to uh, review the rules and review the rules. And actually, this is not only our view, this is also, as I already mentioned, a, a view that is, let's say, commonly shared uh, also at the level of the European Union. And that's also why uh, the European Commission and also the, the uh, 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 under the umbrella, so to speak, also of the European Council has started uh, uh, a process uh, indeed to 
to review the stability and growth pact. Now, first of all, as I already mentioned, despite the fact that we have strict norms for public debt, we have seen that uh, public debt is increasing and is diverging. Uh, and what you see in this graph is the development of um, public debt in the euro area countries. And the yellow bars shows you uh, basically the starting position in 2007 of in terms of the public debt uh, as a ratio of GDP. Then uh, you have 2007 and 2019, and that's the brown part, which comes on top of it. And that's basically the buildup of debt during the uh, following the, the great financial crisis. Um, and then uh, uh, the period 2019, uh, 2021, that of course captures the development of the public debt ratio following also the pandemic. And 2021, uh, those are the, the little small bars. Uh, they represent basically the current uh, uh, debt levels for 2021. So you, so you see two things. First of all, uh, with the exception of a few member states that um, debt has only been adding, has only been going up, uh, and also it's been it's diverging. Uh, if you see where where countries started in 2007 and where they are now, you can see that the difference between the countries that uh, had been confronted with a higher public debt or an increasing public debt and the ones with lower one has actually become yeah, it's increasing. So that's that's the first first observation. Maybe we can go to the next uh, next slide. So the second uh, second observation indeed is that although the stability and growth pact uh, actually uh, never had the intention to work out procyclically. Uh, in the on the contrary, I would actually say um, we see that uh, yeah, in practice it has worked out that way. Uh, so it has actually been uh, enforcing or reinforcing uh, the um, economic cycle instead of uh, instead of stabilizing it. And that can be shown by 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 this graph, uh, the yellow line. Uh, represents what we call the output gap, uh, and that's uh, the difference basically between um, the GDP growth uh, and the um, potential growth uh, of an economy. Uh, and when the output gap is negative, then you are basically in a recession or uh, the, the, the economy is performing less than it could be. And if the output gap is um, uh, uh, positive, uh, uh, then, then, uh, then we are talking about a period where actually the opposite is the case, so that the growth actually is higher than uh, potential potential output. So then you are talking about uh, uh, um, the 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 actually a booming, basically a booming economy. Now, when you the the green lines, they show you the fiscal stance, and that's um, the. Um, uh, uh, basically, the structural, the structural, the structural balance uh, of the structural budget balance, and um, where uh, a plus is, so that's actually an improvement of the structural balance, is associated with a tightening of fiscal policy, uh, and the negative um, uh, 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 fiscal stance is associated with actually a loosening of fiscal policy. Now, and then uh, if you look at the graph, you can see that if you look at the first years here, those are the years 2008, 9 and 10. Those are the years basically of the following the financial crisis. There you see that the output gap is negative and you also see, so there it actually goes well. You also see that um, the um, fiscal policy stance is supporting in a way the economy. It's trying to stabilize it. But that changed in the years thereafter. So if you look at the subsequent years uh, that follow, and those are the years of the Euro sovereign debt crisis, when the output gap was still um, negative, you actually see that there is fiscal tightening where you would not have expected that or from an economic point of view, you would not have desired that. And uh, uh, we see basically then that the output gap is closing. 
um, that was shortly before the pandemic, then you would have expected uh, indeed um, uh, a fiscal tightening uh, to build up the reserve, to build up the necessary reserves, uh, let's say for, for next periods of recession. And you see that it, that did not really happen only marginally uh, in 2018, but actually uh, not in um, not in uh, 17, not in 19. And yeah, you see again uh, a worsening of the fiscal the, pub, the fiscal position in 2020, a sharp decline of the output gap. And of course, this is the pandemic or the impact of the pandemic. What you what you see here. So where where you basically want to have rules that uh, improve the stable the stabilization function of fiscal policy. Uh, what we have seen is, you could say, more or less the opposite. Let's go to the next uh, slide. Um, uh, as I already mentioned, the, the framework has become very complex and also, also sometimes unpredictable. Uh, there are an, an, uh, there's a multiple um, there are multiple indicators that play a role and that are being uh, in judging yet uh, the the public finance situation in a country, it's not only the three percent deficit of the sixty percent uh, uh, debt. There are also a lot of other con uh, uh, indicators. An important indicator is that structural balance I was just referring to. Uh, so that's basically the fiscal position, um, which is uh, which is controlled for uh, for the development of the economy. But um, yeah, this is in particular uh, a very, it's a, economically a very nice concept um, and a very, very, uh, and also theoretically a very um, useful concept. However, it is extremely complicated to measure it. Uh, and what we, what we see is that it also, because it is so complicated to measure and that there are several reasons for that, uh, um, mainly because the, the, the measurement of the output gap is complicated. Uh, it changes a lot over time. And that's also actually what, what you see in the graph, uh, uh, which, which shows you the revision of the structural budget balance uh, in periods of time. Uh, and uh, if you look at, at 2000, uh, uh, 2000 um, uh, 15, uh, the, the, the dark bar for the Netherlands basically shows you uh, that um, in that period between uh, uh, 2015 and 2016, the structural balance uh, was, uh, was adjusted uh, to, um, uh, yeah, was, was adjusted quite substantially. And of course, it makes policy difficult. It makes uh, forecasting uh, extremely complicated, but also assessing whether there is, let's say, uh, an excessive deficit, yes or no. Uh, so this, 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 this concept of structural balance, uh, structural budget balance, uh, budget balance that is adjusted for cyclical developments, theoretically, economically, it's, it's let's say, a very nice concept, but in practice, it, it's, it, it has its complications. Moreover, uh, maybe go back to the if you if one can go. Yeah, the, the last point I would like to, to make is that there are also various exception clauses in the current set of rules. Actually, we are using one of those exception clauses now because due to the pandemic and due to the impact the pandemic has on the fiscal position of many member states, we have kind of frozen, so to speak, uh, the whole stability and growth pact. And this is also something that the Commission is going to revisit actually beginning of this year or in the spring. And also the discretion uh, that exists in excess in assessing, yeah, is there a fiscal, uh, is there a problem in a member state or not, is, is pretty large. Um, so it's too complex. It's like uh, we started building a house um, or we build a house in 1992 and then we start renovating the house uh, throughout the years. Uh, but we do it in an inconsistent manner. So the way, if you would, if you look at the house now, uh, um, uh, uh, to to use the metaphor, we have been building, uh, we have been building uh, staircases that lead nowhere. We have been building doors in walls, uh, and then we have shut the walls again. So we really have to do something about about the the, the building. Now let's go to the next slide then. 
um, what are the possible reforms? What what could be done to improve the, the, the framework? Now, um, first of all, we think that um, uh, the Stability and Growth Pact should be targeting or targeted at uh, the long-term goal or the, 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 the that's uh, public debt. If from our point of view, that should be the main long-term anchor, so to speak, on which all the, the, the rules are being based. Uh, and that also gives you uh, or or it prevents the stability and growth pack from becoming too pro-cyclical. Then we would, instead of the important role that is now given to the structural budget balance, we would say um, use a different kind of indicator, and that's the uh, operational uh, uh, variable. And that is, we would say uh, it's much, much most likely much more effective, I will also show that later, uh, to introduce an expenditure rule, uh, so a rule for the government expenditures in a, in a number of member states. Then we have to create some flexibility when it comes to the path towards that long-term goal of debt sustainability, that's the speed of the reduction of uh, debt. Then an important issue is what to do with public investments and how can you protect public investments, basically. And then also uh, there might, it might be good to look at the governance of the whole uh, set again and um, make some changes in this respect. Um, now, let's go to, uh, to, uh, to these, these elements so one by one, starting with uh, the debt anchor. Now, the 60% of GDP uh, debt limit that is in the Treaty of uh, Maastricht actually is not really based on economic theory. Um, it was at that point in time, uh, it was it was basically the average of public debt um, uh, in, 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 in the European Union. And the same is true for the deficit criterion, by, uh, by the way. And uh, the point, the difficulty is that if you if you start to come up with a debt limit or debt limitation, from uh, from an economic point of view, from a theoretical point of view, you will not find one number, and it's very uh, very depends on the circumstances. Um, let's say what when the public debt is um, sustainable or or not. And to give you to give you an example in this respect, uh, if you would if you look at the current debt levels in 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 the European Union, the euro area, there in some countries they're pretty high. Uh, you just saw the graph. Uh, Italy, for instance, we're talking about uh, a public to the public uh, debt ratio of 160 percent of GDP. Greece, it's about 200 percent of GDP. Now, when interest rate is very low, uh, um, you can say, okay, this is pretty sustainable. However, if the interest rate uh, is higher or starts to increase, then of course uh, the, the 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 situation might change completely. Uh, and what this graph shows you uh, is the, um, the fiscal deficit or surplus that you need to stabilize the debt level at the initial level, um, given, um, let's say, a number of different interest rates. And actually, it's not so much the, only the interest rate, it's the differential between the interest rate and growth that matters, uh, how public debt in the longer term perspective develops uh, because the public debt is mostly mostly uh, indicated as a percentage of GDP. Uh, so if GDP growth is very high or relatively high, then your public debt ratio decreases as well and the other way around. So uh, what what one is interested in is is the differential. And um, you can see now let's take let's take indeed a country that has a public debt uh, uh, ratio of 100% of GDP, uh, you see that when um, the interest rate growth differential is favorable, uh, so basically when interest rate is very low and uh, growth is relatively high, that this country can run a deficit, structural deficit, and by this now or primary uh, deficit, and this is the def deficit that where you take out the interest rate payments, that need to be paid by the government because of the debt they hold, 
then uh, you see that you can you can very well live with it uh, with a deficit of two percent deficit a deficit of two percent of gdp would stabilize your debt ratio at 100 percent of gdp however if the interest rates are going up and gdp growth is going down then it completely changes uh, and if you look at the right hand side of the graph then you actually would need to have a surplus of four percent of gdp to sustain uh, to sustain a debt level of um, 100%. Uh, and a surplus of 4% is a lot. Uh, uh, if you look at uh, the, Euro, Euro, Europe, the European Union, uh, on average, you can see or you can see that the primary uh, surplus, the primary balance uh, has on average over a longer period has been a little bit higher than zero. Uh, uh, indeed, some countries like indeed Italy have had a very high primary balance for a period, short period of time or period of time, but it really is an effort. So you see that the, the sustainability of debt can completely change depending on the circumstances. Let's go to the next uh, uh, slide. Um, I think if you if you look at it from uh, an economic point of view, purely from econo to economic theory, uh, I think you could say, OK, 60 percent, maybe we could uh, increase it a little bit. I don't know, maybe to 70, maybe 80. Um, but there are several, there are a number of risks in this respect. First of all, as I just showed, it leads to a high, higher vulnerability, uh, especially for an increase in interest rate. Um, but even if you have um, a, a, a higher debt anchor, even if you let's say raise the bar, so to speak, from 60% to 70 or 80, still, um, it's still then a huge challenge for a number of countries to, let's say, have a credible reduction path for your public debt. So it's not going to change that problem uh, in the end. Uh, then the debt criterion is uh, part of the treaty. Actually, it's part of, the of a treaty protocol so you can only change it when all the member states agree. So it requires unanimity. Um, the same is true for the deficit criterion, by the way. So what we say is um, keep uh, uh, the level of the debt criterion as it is, as 60% of GDP. Try not to change it for the numbers, I for the reasons I just mentioned, but improve the framework that kind of surrounds this uh, debt anchor. Uh, uh, instead, because that's easier, and also from a, from a legal point of view, can be done in a in a much easier uh, way. Um, yeah, what what is, so this is the goal. The goal is ha have a sustainable level of debt. Now, how to what would be a very good operational or good operational uh, variable to kind of get there? Um, now, at the moment, there is a rule that says that um, if your your debt is higher than 60% of GDP, uh, every year you should reduce your debt um, by one twentieth of the difference between your current debt level and the 60%. The problem of that one twentieth rule, and I will show that later for for some research that we did for Italy, is that uh, it can be uh, pro-cyclical, uh, uh, it work, can work outlook pro-cyclical, and it can lead to a reduction path that's simply not credible because it it, it would ask uh, too much. Um, then I already then we have the structural balance. Uh, I already mentioned that, which has its drawbacks uh, because economically, theoretically, it's a very fine concept, and I would definitely recommend it. But however. Um, measuring it is complicated and it changes a lot over the period. So it doesn't really make it from that point of view a very useful uh, operational variable. So what we uh, basically say is that most likely, and also this one has, has disadvantages by the way, but most likely the best uh, under the circumstances, best operational val variable or, va or rule that you can have is to have an expenditure rule. So basically, um, uh, determine at uh, at the national level, let's say the maximum increase of government expenditures during a certain period. 
why is this uh, preferable over the other ones? First of all, it leaves room for automatic stabilization. It's a, it's a rule that applies to expenditures and not, let's say, on the income side. So that means that if taxes uh, or um, uh, 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 if they change because of, let's say, the economic cycle, uh, for instance, the economy uh, is uh, going into a recession, which means that taxes will go down, tax income will go down. Um, it's then basically something you accept. The other way around as well, uh, if taxes go up because of the economic cycle, you do not automatically start spending the money, uh, but use it actually to build up reserves. Uh, um, you also would have to exclude, for instance, something like unemployment, unemployment benefits, uh, so because they would fluctuate as well. So the expenditure rule uh, leaves you um, leeway for automatic stabilization. It's under control of governments. It's something governments can really control. This is not the case with the structural balance because a lot of the it's out of your control because we don't know how to measure it. This is something which you can measure quite easily. Uh, and you can set it for uh, multiple years. And that's also important when you have a rule that you don't have to change it every year. The drawback of this uh, of this rule, and I basically implicitly already mentioned it, is that you have to decide what is part, what falls under the, the, the cap for expenditures and what not. And there, of course, is the discussion, and there will be discussion um, uh, uh, about that. So that, that makes it, uh, there. that's the weakness, I, 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 I would say. Uh, let's go to the next, uh, the next slide. Um, this is the example uh, I was talking about. Uh, that's Italy. Actually, what we did is uh, um, uh, a kind of counterfactual exercise where we saw what would have, where we tried to find out what would have happened with the public debt in Italy and the um, uh, the, the 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 deficit in in Italy based on the number of these rules I was just talking about. So the actual development is the black line. That's actually what happened over this period of time. So you see that the public debt went up, went up quite a lot. Um, and then you also see that, uh, that there was actually a primary surplus most of the time, as you can see. And there was only a deficit in 2009. Now, if you would use the, the, the 120th rule I was just talking about, you would see actually that the public debt, uh, and that's the red dotted line, uh, or striped line, you would see that public debt goes down um, very quickly, but you also see that the, the level of primary balances or surpluses that are being used as a percentage of GDP are very high for a very long period of time and would politically totally not be acceptable. It's out of the question that a country can achieve something like this. Now, uh, you could say, okay, what not when when what would happen if you would not look uh, if you would say I change the rule from one twentieth to one fortieth, um, and um, uh, same kind of picture. That's the red dotted line. So we introduce an expenditure growth rule, and there we basically said the growth of the expenditure should be aligned with a long term stabilization of your debt ratio at sixty percent. Now, and if you do that, uh, then you see that uh, the debt is still relatively high compared to the uh, the red lines, but it is much lower than it currently is, and it's also it starts to decline basically yeah, in 2000. What is it? 2014, and you see also that the primary balance, the primary uh, surplus that is needed in this particular case. Uh, it's a little bit higher than what currently is the case, but it's not out of bounds. Uh, it's still achievable. Uh, so this, and we also, by the way, did this for a number of other countries, and uh, but also due to the time, I, I'm, I'm only discussing Italy here. But basically, it shows the same same picture. Now let's go to the to the next uh, slide. That's the debt reduction speed. Um, uh, at at what at what speed do you want to? Uh, um, go towards the 60%. Now, the 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 120th rule, as I already mentioned and also have shown for Italy, can can uh, require very unrealistic budgetary surpluses, especially when growth is very low. 
So there we would say uh, um, maybe one should try to make that a little bit more country specific. So try to take into account country specific factors and also try to see whether, um, I mean, what is the origin of why public debt increased? Uh, one could say that uh, if the, the, for instance, the public, the increase in public debt that we have seen recently, the last two years due to, to COVID, you can say, yeah, I mean, this is not, this is not something that was easily to be it was to be influenced easily by government. So maybe you should treat that differently than, uh, let's say, a public debt, what basically was caused by excessive spending. Uh, I totally realize, or we totally realize, when you see that, when you say this, uh, it should be country specific that you also open in a way a Pandora's box in terms of, but how do you define country specific? What kind of variables? What kind of factors would you look at? Uh, um, so there is a there is a, a risk in introducing, uh, let's say, country specific um, factors here. Let's go to the next slide. And that's the issue of public investment. And what we have seen is actually that uh, public investments, uh, when a country needs to reduce expenditures and when a country needs to to cut its debt, reducing uh, public investments is one of the things they do then uh, very quickly. And this is also um, what you hear see what you see here in the graph is the development of public investment as a percentage of GDP in the euro area. And there you see actually that after the financial crisis, it dropped a lot, it dropped markedly. And if I would make a distinction, actually I would if I would show you the distinction between the high debt countries and the low debt countries in the euro area, you would see that the high debt countries actually have decrease the public uh, the public investment much more than the low um, uh, low countries uh, the the low debt countries um, and indeed exactly if you if you look at Italy uh, Italy had actually uh, a primary surplus over uh, quite a long period of time but they achieved this uh, to a large extent by reducing public investments uh, and by doing so you're actually uh, reducing public investments is detrimental to economic growth, at least uh, uh, economic growth in a longer term perspective. So in the new setup of rules, you want to protect this a little bit. And um, that's complicated, and, uh, but, but at least that's something we have to, to see how we can do that. Let's go to the next slide. Um, one, one way of doing that is the so-called golden rule, introducing of the golden rule. So basically, uh, the, the golden rule is basically uh, uh, saying that um, the, uh, the the public investment uh, to GDP ratio, um, uh, the, the, uh, sh sorry, I would say the deficit to GDP ratio can be equal to your public uh, the pub the pu public investment to GDP ratio. Um, but the problem is um, how do you exactly measure whether something is a public investment, yes or no. Uh, and there, there, there might indeed be a tendency to, to make the scope as much as possible. Uh, when we are talking about building, uh, let's say, a, um, a, a wind power plant or something like that, or building a, a rail, uh, 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 railways, um, yeah, most likely we will very so quickly agree that this is public investment. But you can also say, what about spending money on education? Uh, is this public investment? Yes or no? Uh, so um, it's quite complicated to come to uh, to come to a good uh, definition here. And so an, an exceptional or different treatment for investment spending can only work if there is an independent assessment. Uh, so if not um, politicians, let's put it this way, but also uh, independent institutions say this is a public investment and this isn't. And also that you still have, let's say, ensure sustainability. Probably you still have to say, OK, but it cannot be more than, let's say, a certain percentage. OK, then let's go to the, the, the last element of the reforms, and that's the governance aspect of it. Um, of course, better rules will already lead to, to a pressure uh, uh, will already reduce the pressure 
for flexibility and let's say political implementation. But we think the governments could could be improved by giving the so-called national independent fiscal institutions a bigger role and they assess basically the national fiscal plans. Um, I don't know exactly uh, which uh, institution in Belgium is the independent fiscal institution. In the Netherlands, it's actually two. Uh, it's the um, we have something that's called the Central Plan Bureau. It sounds like a, a, a communist uh, planning office. It's not, uh, but it's it's basically the 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 let's say uh, economic. Uh, um, uh, it's part of the government, but it's independent agency that uh, let's say assesses uh, economic developments, comes up with economic projections, and that's that's also being used by the government basically to assess their own plans. And also our uh, Council of State, the Raad van State, that's the other one. So they they share this role, uh, and you one could could imagine that at the national level they 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 get a more important role. For instance, they could decide on uh, what is the definition of public investment, um, but they could also decide on the so-called country-specific factors for public debt production. I was talking about. And there we also have something at the European level. It's called the European Fiscal Board, the EFB. And the role of that uh, institution, which is currently composed basically of academics, could also be increased. And another thing, another element that works well, I mean, now if you have an excessive deficit, um, uh, then we, we impose penalties on countries. At least we try to impose penalties on countries. Now, um, that's uh, a neg uh, that's that's what we call the stick instead of the carrot. And then uh, you are imposing penalties, financial penalties on countries that already have an excessive deficit. I have a poor fiscal uh, situation. So is that really giving you the right incentive? So maybe you should turn it around uh, and 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 come up with carrots. And that's actually the way how the next generation EU fund is working. You get the money. Uh, um, but you have to you have to apply with a number of conditions. Uh, uh, you have to come up with a with a with a with a with a plan how to reform your economy, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so you could actually imagine in making a link between meeting the criteria for the, the stability and growth pact and, and money that one could get basically from the European Union. Okay, let's go to the, the next slide. I'm coming to my 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 conclusions. Um, yeah, the current rules, they, they no longer provide uh, a credi credible framework to meet today, today's challenges. And how could this fiscal framework be improved at the European level? Uh, one, by giving uh, the expenditure rule uh, a central role. By secondly, by making the debt adjustment path more realistic. Third, by trying to see whether it's possible to come up with an, a different treatment for public investment. But as I already mentioned, this requires some safeguards and then a stronger role for um, independent assessment huh, of, the, of the government policy or the national member states policy and limiting the discretions that we currently have in the, in the, in the, in the framework. OK, uh, I think I've gone through my slides. Um, just uh, just checking it here. Uh, uh, yes, so maybe we can take the slides off and then uh, I'm happy to answer your your questions and uh, have a little bit of discussion. I think we have uh, what is it about 10 minutes left, at least in my calendar 10 minutes left. Uh, but uh, I'm 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 totally happy to uh, yeah to get some questions and to have some discussion. Thank you very much. I have a, a practical question. You speak about the sustainability of the debt as a criteria, but uh, does the the implementation of the sustainability imply or do, does that imply uh, a criteria about primary deficit of not? No, what uh, not necessarily. So what you would do is basically, um, you you have to 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 make a number of assumptions. First of all, uh, as I just mentioned, keep the sixty percent. Uh, but yeah. but you would have to compute what is my expenditure rule? What is the maximum growth of expenditures that is allowed? 
uh, given where I am now uh, in terms of public debt and where I have to go in terms at the long longer term. Um, and of course, you you need other inputs as well. You need you need uh, inputs about economic growth, inflation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and then you also have to to um, uh, to make um, an assumption about the adjustment path, because I mean, how fast do you want the debt to decline? Uh, uh, towards sixty, I can, do I have do I have uh, 200 years for this or whatever. Now, then from when you compute this, uh, when you take the, all these inputs into account, then you can come up with an expenditure rule. And basically you can say that the deficit, um, the primary deficit, basically is um, the output or the outcome of that process, but it can fluctuate. Uh, so it fluctuates depending also on um, the economic cycle. So it's very well possible that you have a primary deficit um, because let's say you are in a recession, uh, but then I would say as long as your expenditures are below your, your growth path, um, then I would say there's nothing to worry about because in the longer term, you would still be, 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 let's say, where you want to be and you allow automatic stabilizers to work through because this is exactly the point. Uh, so that that if the deficit uh, increases because of the economic cycle, that you're not forced to immediately react to it, because this is one of the reasons why you have this pro-cyclical behavior. But the other is true as well. Uh, so if you have if the economy is doing very well, and if your primary deficit is actually turning into a primary surplus, then you should also be allowed or should also feel constrained by your expenditure rule and not starting uh, adjusting your expenditures upward, uh, because otherwise, of course, you will know you will not have the buffer that will help you in those times of recession. So um, um, you could still have the 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 three percent criterion, by the way, uh, but it would become a little bit less important uh, that's uh, than it currently is. Striking, deleting the three percent criterion is complicated. Uh, for the same reasons as it is to to change the 60 percent because it's part of the treaty. But um, uh, it would this would allow, uh, let's say, more deviations from the 3 percent without, let's say, immediately interfering. Thank you very much. There is just a question uh, to explain uh, again the implementation of the expenditure rule for Italy uh, in uh, your graph. Uh, maybe uh, some people don't uh, understand very well your implementation of the expenditure rule. Could you explain again? Yeah, basically what we did is, uh, so we, we looked at um, how did the public situation, the public finance situation in Italy developed uh, uh, in, in a period of time. And um, we said, OK, now let's go back to the beginning of that period and assume we would have uh, we would have introduced other kinds of rules and Italy would have implemented these kind of rules. And uh, so one one is this one one twentieth rule. Then we also use the one fortieth rule as an alternative to the one twentieth. And to come to that expenditure rule, uh, uh, what, what we 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 basically computed for every year, the level of expenditure uh, that is allowed and that allows you to bring back or to, to reduce the public debt of Italy uh, in a longer term perspective to 60%. And uh, we basically used variables like growth and inflation uh, uh, that uh, um, let's say at that point in time, were considered as the long, long-term long variables. So we didn't kind of make any kind of new assumptions, but the assumptions that were already there. Uh, and then you see that if you, if you kind of compute that rule, that it's more realistic from political point of view, while at the same time, it still leads to a reduction of debt. And not as quickly as it would be under the current rules, but as I just said, the current rules are uh, I mean, I mean the the implementation of the current current rules 
uh, would would be uh, from a political point of view would simply be not only acceptable but also from an economic point of view uh, uh, to basically say to the Italian government but you have to you need to have a primary surplus of uh, what is it six seven percent every year for a long period of time yeah I mean any government you would tell that they would say you're totally crazy uh, uh, it's too much and it would also hurt, uh, be harmful for the economy it would work out extremely pro-cyclical. So, so yeah, that's not going to work. Um, underlying the graph, because I, I, I totally understand, you know, uh, when you have to explain something which is a little bit more technical in a short period of time, uh, 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 that that's not always easy. There is a paper that, uh, and and I will I will discuss with my colleagues, but I think we can share that paper with you and it explains a little bit more into depth what we've done here. It's it's technical, not too technical. It's not completely filled with formulas. Thank you very much for the paper. Um, there is a, a political question uh, because it seems to be uh, to, to, to be a, a difference uh, between your explanation and your vision of the uh, modification of fiscal rule and maybe the political position of the government of Netherlands. Yes. Is it correct? <laughs> and what is the uh, reaction? Yes, this is not the position of the government. Uh, uh, you're totally right. Uh, this is the position of the central bank. Uh, the government still has to determine its position. Uh, the the uh, What I basically have been telling here, I've also been telling in Parliament. Uh, I was, by the way, not the only one, but another a number of other organizations as well. If I look at Parliament, there there is, um, let's say, uh, the discussion is mainly about 60%. So there are a number of political parties who really want to change the 60% and increase it. But other political parties who don't want to do that, I don't know the official position of the, 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 the new Minister of Finance on this, but uh, let's say judging from the conversations, of course, that we have with uh, the, our colleagues from the working at the Ministry, I think the, the, the Ministry of Finance is not is indeed just as we are, not in favour of adjusting the 60%. Um, then, of course, the other, the other um, uh, discussion is about uh, the introduction of the expenditure rule and uh, the treatment of, uh, of public investments. There, I think the, the, our colleagues at the Ministry of Finance, they understand our economic uh, line of thinking and our economic line of reasoning, but they are a little bit afraid of that you create new kind of exceptions and new, uh, let's say, discussions about what is a public investment and what not. What is what kind of expenditures fall under the, the, the cap and whatnot. And we we acknowledge this. That's why we say, but this is something you have, you, you should have it determined by a more independent, uh, let's say, uh, agency. Um, and uh, um, so there, I think, I think uh, probably the, at least our colleagues at the Ministry of Finance are a little bit more strict, I think, than we are. But uh, as I said, the, the, the Dutch when it comes to the reform of the, the SGP, yeah, the, formally the Dutch government still has to, uh, has to uh, define its position. And of course, uh, yeah, we just had a, a new mi Minister of Finance. She started uh, two weeks ago. Uh, and she's also from a different uh, political party than the previous Minister of Finance, although the, the coalition government in the Netherlands is composed of the same parties as the, the one before. Um, we will see. Uh, I don't know, but uh, it, but it's totally right that, that, that this is our position, our view as Dutch Central Bank, and it's not necessarily the position of the Ministry of Finance. And uh, if the Ministry of Finance or the Minister of Finance would have, in the end, somewhat different position, I think that's totally fine. We're used to that in the Netherlands that um, yeah, we do not necessarily have to need to have the same view. Uh, we are an independent institution, and and uh, it's, that's not going to be the end of the world. Let's put it that way. Uh, another question uh, in a few minutes. Um, in your presentation, uh, you, you the governance um, should be continue to be political. Uh, it's not a very big difference with the point of view of Blanchard. 
uh, with the governance of the fiscal rules is more technical. Uh, it's correct or not correct? Um, I think in the end, the decisions on expenditures and how you allocate uh, the, 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 let's say, public money should be a political one. And and of course you can say yeah you know we need to uh, we need to have the the whole fiscal policy making in the hand of technicians but I don't think that's going to work to be quite frank um, some people may may argue for it but um, I don't think that's uh, uh, we we have this this division of labor so to speak uh, we have monetary policy which is in the hand of a central bank that's an independent institution. Um, we have fiscal policy, which is in the hand of the governments, and the governments are democratically elected and controlled democratically. And I think there are good reasons. Uh, I think it should not be up to a group of technicians to, spe to decide how much you spend on education or on healthcare or whatever. However, um, uh, there are certain technical assumptions that you kind of need in making that fiscal policy where you could say, OK, this is something where we ask the experts. Uh, so it's up to us, governments, to decide how much we spend on education and healthcare. And we also know that that there is a trade off. I mean, most likely we cannot spend, you know, as much as we really would like to. But that's our in that's a democratic uh, uh, issue. But at a certain point, uh, if we say, uh, OK, this is we work, we assume we work with this expenditure rule and expenditure cap. And if we say uh, 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 this is it, um, then how it is exactly defined, that's something that you can leave to, let's say, an independent institution. Because it's, uh, of course, it indirectly has an impact on the kind of policies you're, you're, you're making, but uh, not directly. So I would like to make that distinction um, between, between those two concepts, basically. Okay, thank you very much. Chris, do you see another question? Um, yes, there is uh, Peter Grootveldler who has a uh, question, but it's uh, not really the theme of today, I, I suppose, but uh, about um, the, the near future. He thinks uh, there are rumors uh, on the bank crash uh, and he Ask if you have an opinion about that. I don't know if you. There are two two things I would like to say on this. First of all, if I just look at the and, and now I can I can I'm 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 mainly talking for the Netherlands because I that's the country I know best. But I think it's also true at the European level. If I just look at capital ratios, solvency ratios of banks, they're actually in good shape overall. Actually, uh, looking at the solvency ratio of banks in the Netherlands, that despite the pandemic, they have actually been going up. The last two years. Um, second comment I would like, which I always make when I get questions like this, yeah, you know, if I knew I would probably have a different job, uh, uh, which would most likely be paid uh, or I could make a lot of money doing something else. Um, and although it's our job uh, to to try to come up with an assessment, not only of the current situation in the economy, but also how the economy might develop over time, yeah, we also know that uh, this is extremely complicated. Huh? Uh, economic science, uh, actually, it's not a science, it's an art, uh, to be quite frank. It's not a science like physics or mathematics, although some economics, some economists, they, they want to give that impression, but it's not. And that also makes it very interesting from my point of view. So, uh, but if I would really have, a, like, say, crystal ball and I could predict the future in that way, um, I would probably not working at, uh, not be working at the central bank. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. Okay, so well, you see another question? I think we have uh, done it. Um, also, the this of Renat Hansen's do you have a thing? We oh, yes, yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much for your presentation, uh, for your disponibility. It was a real pleasure to work with you. Uh, and thank you very much for your paper. To, uh, to uh, I will see to it that you will get it, and then you can distribute it among the participants. OK, thank you. Uh, maybe if you have a few minutes, a, a question about, because in Belgium we have a problem of uh, fiscal rule 
uh, between Belgium institution uh, to uh -huh. organize uh, the path, uh, the fiscal path between uh, federal state and uh, um, federal entities. Uh, do we have the same problem with the decentralization in the Netherlands? No, not really. I mean, from uh, from uh, I mean, uh, if you compare the Netherlands to to Belgium, uh, the Netherlands is really. Uh, I mean, we have provinces, we have municipalities. There are also issues, by the way, yeah, uh, because also the provinces have their budget and the municipalities as well. But um, yeah, the Netherlands is is a centralized country from that point of view, uh, uh, and definitely compared to Belgium. So. Um, if if there would be somebody working for for a province of the Netherlands or uh, here, he or she would definitely say that yeah we have some issues. I think it's true, but overall, it it is it is just a fraction of what you see in Belgium in this respect because the institutional setup of the country is different. Okay, and there, the there Netherlands is, no, is not a federal country. Yeah. There are no fiscal autonomy of for the province. No. no. Okay. So it also means that in, if they if they uh, if they uh, excusez le mot if they screw it up, uh, the the central government will definitely intervene. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. See you. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, it was a pleasure, and um, it was a pleasure being being with you. Thank okay. you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.